Now that we have a handle on the respiratory system anatomy, let's look at some respiratory tract disorders. First though, let's look at some signs and symptoms associated with these um, disorders. One of course is a cough. Um, cough is just a way to um, aspirate stuff out of the respiratory tract, maybe in, um, inhaled some water or, or something went down as we say the wrong pipe, then you use a cough to try to get that out. Dyspnea is shortness of breath, so the patient um, must make a greater effort to breathe. As you can see, this guy here is holding his hand to his chest because he's trying to get a better breath. Dyspnea is associated with a lot of disorders, which I've listed over here on this picture. Cyanosis is bluish discoloration of the skin. This is caused because of vasoconstriction and decreased blood flow to the tissues, or it could be because of increased amount of deoxygenated hemoglobin out into the systemic circulation. One of the disorders associated with infants is called infant respiratory distress syndrome. This is more common among premature babies because premature babies tend to be low in surfactant. Surfactant is produced only in the last two months of fetal development so that if a baby is born premature, say in that seventh month, then they haven't had the time yet to produce surfactant. Remember, surfactant is used to keep the lungs from collapsing. It breaks up the surface tension. So without that surfactant, the alveoli collapse, as seen in this picture over here, and so that every time the baby inhales, he has to reinflate those alveoli to breathe, and that takes a lot of work, and it's too difficult for the baby to breathe properly. So he doesn't get enough oxygen into his lungs, or enough air in his lungs, and then therefore enough oxygen into the blood and tissues. And then that can cause um, brain damage if nothing's done to correct it. So to treat this, a couple things you can do if a premature baby doesn't have enough surfactant, then they will spray surfactant into the newborn's respiratory passageways. And this actually is a strategy that was um, discovered or first used by doctors here in the Buffalo area. And then the other is to put the baby on a, respira a respirator. Um, but a respirator it has its own problems because the respirator is actually forcing air into the lungs. It has a positive pressure that's pushing air into the lungs. Then that can actually cause tissue damage. And so the longer a baby is on a respirator, the more likely they're going to have lung damage throughout the rest of their lives. Another strategy that can be used if the doctor knows that the baby won't go full term, say if, we're ha if the mother is having um, contractions too early, or, you know, maybe at seven months and there's just not a chance they're going to make it full term, the doctor will start giving the mother steroids. And those steroids, of course, will cross the placenta and get into the baby and speed up the development of the baby. And that way the um, baby starts producing um, surfactant earlier in development so that even if it's born premature, it may have formed enough surfactant to be able to um, inflate, keep its lungs inflated properly. Another disorder is called the, a pneumothorax. Now a pneumothorax is basically a lung that's collapsed. And this has to do with the fact that we've got air um, in the pleural cavity and it results from the destruction of that negative pressure in the pleural cavity. Since there's no negative pressure there anymore, there's nothing keeping the lungs glued to the wall of the thoracic cavity, so their elasticity um, would cause them to recoil and then and collapse. Um, so things such as a bleb, which is basically like a little bubble that may form related to COPD um, that ruptures would then allow air into that um, pleural cavity, or thoracic um, basically a, an injection of air or other or even some fluids into um, that pleural cavity obviously a stab wound from trauma or secondary infections any of these can lead to the lungs collapsing uh, things that you see with a person who has a pneumothorax of course is dyspnea difficulty breathing obviously anxiety pleural pain tachycardia because the heart's trying to make up for the decreased amount of oxygen delivery to the tissues um, asymmetrical chest wall expansion, you can see that, that side that's collapsed doesn't expand as well, or decreased breath sounds simply because they don't have a lung, they're expanding so you're not going to hear anything.
To treat it, they use a chest tube, insert a tube into the pleural cavity to drain out the air and, and then uh, reestablish that negative pressure and then the lungs will expand uh, very quickly. Some other pulmonary disorders include acute bronchitis. This is an infection of the bronchi or bronchioles and that in, is an inflammatory response causes the bronchioles or bronchi to uh, constrict. So you go from a lumen that's nice and big, wide open to a very small lumen. So that's obviously going to interfere with your ability to uh, get air into and out of the lungs. Pneumonia is due to an infection causing inflammation and leakage of fluids into the alveoli. So the alveoli start filling with fluids. So again, that's not going to be able to breathe properly. Think of these sort of as this one sort of increasing that respiratory membrane thickness because now any air that does go in that alveoli is going to have to go through all the thick fluid of uh, that's formed from the pneumonia and then through the respiratory membrane to get out to the blood. A pulmonary edema is accumulation of fluids in the alveoli um, and then again respiration is going to deteriorate because you're again making that respiratory membrane a lot thicker and so the oxygen has a longer way to travel. Pulmonary embolisms are another disorder. Pulmonary embolisms can result from example a deep vein thrombosis as we've seen here. We've talked about before the idea that a blood clot in the leg is going to travel up, go through the right side of the heart and then end up being lodged in the lung since that's the next small vessel it comes in contact with. Any tissue that is served by that those uh, blood vessels then is going to end up becoming infarcted. The symptoms that we see with pulmonary embolism um, may be hard to diagnose because the symptoms uh, may occur with or, or are similar to other conditions such as a heart attack or a panic attack or, or even pneumonia can happen. So a uh, person shows up saying they, are short, they have shortness of breath or dyspnea, they have sharp chest pain, um, they're grabbing at their chest, they're breathing rapidly, they're anxious, they're sweating. I mean, it all sounds like a heart attack. So it's going to be one of those that you have to be very careful in the diagnosis of it. Another disorder we see with the respiratory tract would be asthma. This is characterized by uh, bronchial constriction of the airways. Again, so instead of having a nice wide lumen for air passageways, now you have this smaller lumen. Um, the airways typically become inflamed and swell and start secreting mucus and then that ends up again reducing the ability to get air into the lungs. Symptoms is usually diffuse wheezing, dyspnea, cough, and spasmodic contractions of the bronchi. The high-risk populations include African Americans, inner city dwellers, and premature or low-weight children. About 50% of asthmatics are younger than age 10. It's more twice as common in boys than in girls. There are different kinds of um, asthma. Uh, one that you probably think of more often is the immune-mediated um, asthma. This is an IgE trigger, so it's a hypersensitivity issue um, where it's associated with a history of hay fever, family history, animal dander, or household dust. Um, and then so it's so IgE you get stimulation of mast cells that release histamine and then that leads to the vaso or excuse me the uh, bronchoconstriction. There are also neural mediated types of asthma. These are not immune system involvement in these. Um, exercise induced asthma is one of those that you might have heard of before. That's common in childhood and adolescence where the bronchospasms often occur within three minutes after the end of exercise and usually resolve at 60 minutes afterwards. Occupational asthma is associated with pollutants. Um, you get an abnormal autonomic receptors in the bronchial smooth muscle and mucous glands and that can induce air pollutants associated with occupation exposure um, and physical exertion. COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is a disease characterized by airflow limitation and is, that's not fully reversible. In other words, it's a chronic condition. It's constantly you um, are dealing with a lower amount of airflow into the lungs. 
It includes chronic bronchitis. Now, notice not acute bronchitis, which is basically an infection. Chronic bronchitis is, uh, is defined as producing sputum more days than not for at least three months a year at, for, for at least two years. That's a clinical definition for chronic bronchitis. Emphysema occurs when there's destruction of the parenchymal um, structures associated with the bronchioles or the alveoli so that they no longer have that uh, elastic recoil of the lungs, which, and that elastic recoil is what's going to help drive air out when you exhale. So in other words, instead of having these nice alveoli and these structures, the walls in between, those walls get destroyed, so now you just have one big air sac instead of a bunch of a lot of little air sacs. And that causes a loss of elasticity in the lungs. So that's going to end our look at the respiratory disorders. Next we'll start with the physiology and how you breathe or inhale and exhale.